The applications of large multiplex panels for detection of pathogens have greatly expanded in the past several years. Initial tests were for detection of respiratory viruses, and the first such test was labor-intensive and vulnerable to frequent contamination. Since then, additional sample types have been added, such as cerebral spinal fluid and positive blood culture broths, and tests are easier to perform and reasonably reliable. Today we'll be discussing a research-use-only multiplex PCR assay for detection of pathogens in joint infections and learning how it compares to targeted metagenomic sequencing and culture for detection of pathogens and periprosthetic joint infections. Welcome to Editors in Conversation. Please subscribe to this podcast and rate or review it. This episode is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm your co-host, JCM Editor-in-Chief Alex McAdam. Editors in Conversation is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. I hope you'll submit your next paper to JCM, and if you do, you can get up to 50% off the publication fee if you were a member of ASM. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Dr. Ellie Thiel. Ellie is an editor of JCM and a clinical microbiologist at the Mayo Clinic. How are you doing, Ellie? I'm pretty good, Alex. Had a nice holiday, some days off, which was nice. Good. Uh, starting the New Year's off right, I think. Did you have any New Year's resolutions this year? I do have some New Year's resolutions. I have one that is uh, bird-related, of course. I have set myself a number of birds I want to see in the state of Massachusetts in the next year. I will not be divulging that number publicly. Oh, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> it would make real bird watchers sneer. It's too low. Oh my gosh. But, uh, but on top of that, I have one that's more related to clinical microbiology. So I, this is kind of weird, but even as an editor-in-chief, I don't read papers front to back very often. I dip into them to find specific facts, or I'm revising a chapter and I go in there to find out what we're calling this species now, and just pull out what I need. So my New Year's resolution is to try to read a couple of papers a week from beginning to end and really take them in. How about you? Interesting. Um, so my resolution, I have two as well. Um, you know, after how the last podcast went uh, <laughs> last year, last month, I should say, also last year, um, I think I should try to become a Mensa member um, you know, after that nice discussion. And for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, I recommend you go back and listen to the December episode. Um, but in case that resolution doesn't pan out, um, my other more achievable goal is actually to be better with deadlines and time management and not overcommit, um, which I think many of us can relate to. So it is tough not to overcommit. Yeah. So I think in December of this year, we should reassess how we did. I look forward to it. I think you can do both those things. I'm sure of it. <laughs> we are also joined by Dr. Marissa Azad. Dr. Azad is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Ottawa Hospital and an associate clinical scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Her research focuses on exploiting molecular and microbial mechanisms of periprosthetic joint infections to develop novel rapid diagnostics and therapeutics. Marissa, thanks very much for joining us. It's great to be here. Thank you. And we are joined further by Dr. Robin Patel. Dr. Patel is the co-director of the Bacteriology Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic, where she is a professor of medicine and professor of microbiology. Dr. Patel has a productive research program, and one long-standing area of research is orthopedic infections. Among her many appointments, Dr. Patel was an editor of JCM from 2009 to 2019. Robin, we're delighted to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much, Alex and Ali. It's wonderful to be here and chat with you about one of my favorite topics, periprosthetic joint infection. Excellent. We're going to talk about a paper that you have in the current issue, the December issue of JCM, and the title is Comparison of the BioFire Joint Infection Panel to 16S Ribosomal RNA Gene-Based Targeted Metagenomic Sequencing for Testing Synovial Fluid from Patients with Knee Arthroplasty Failure and we will put a link to that paper in the show notes. So let's jump right in, and we'll start with you, Marissa. Can you give us an introduction to prosthetic joint infections for people who may be less familiar with them? What's the importance of them? Mm -hmm. So the use of prosthetic implants in joint reconstruction surgery 
has completely revolutionized the clinic, clinical care of patients with osteoarthritis and other joint diseases. However, periprosthetic joint infection, or PJI, is a devastating complication of joint reconstruction surgery, which leads to a significant reduction in patient quality of life and poses a high burden of cost on the healthcare system. The sequela of PJI often includes recurrent infections, antibiotic resistance, and antibiotic-associated complications uh, due to chronic use, multiple revision surgeries, and ultimately, loss of joint function. Although the incidence of PGI is approximately 1 to 2% for primary surgeries, the incidence of PGI is predicted to increase due to an aging patient population and an increase in the indications for joint reconstruction surgery, as well as perhaps due to an increase in the use of immunomodulatory drugs. Additional risk factors for PGI include various comorbidities ranging from rheumatoid arthritis to type 2 diabetes, malignancy, chronic kidney disease, uh, obesity and lymphedema, uh, various surgical risk factors such as prior arthroplasty and, of course, prior PGI, um, and even postoperative complications such as wound dehiscence, prolonged OR times, and lastly, a variety of microbial risk factors as well, including bacteremia, for example, especially with more virulent organisms such as Staphylococcus aureus. The standard of care to treat PGI includes systemic antibiotic therapy and surgical replacement or removal of the infected implant. But the first step to treat PGI successfully is to achieve a rapid and accurate diagnosis. Well, that sounds a lot easier said than done. Uh, as we currently do not have a single standalone test that can diagnose PGI with high accuracy. Um, the diagnosis of PGI is also uh, challenging in that it often requires multiple clinical specimens and diagnostic techniques, some with prolonged result turnaround times. There is also the problem of culture-negative PGI, which can account for up to 40% of cases. Uh, given all of these challenges, uh, there is a desperate integral need for rapid culture independent techniques for uh, microbiologic PGI diagnosis. Thank you. And just to make sure I understood correctly, am I right that you said that the, the artificial joint has to be removed frequently uh, when it's infected? Yeah, usually that's the, the standard of care to remove the infected implant, if possible. So this is very high stakes? Very high stakes, very devastating outcomes. So Robin, Marissa pointed out just a few of the challenges associated with um, a diagnosis of PJI, but can you talk about what the current process is for diagnosing these infections? Absolutely. This is a, an area that we've been working in uh, for over two decades, and I, I think there's been a lot of progress. Uh, sometimes it's easy to make a diagnosis of periprosthetic joint infection, for example, with acute infection, or if there's a sinus tract that's present, chronic infection. But many patients have localized joint pain alone, and that can be hard to uh, determine whether that's periprosthetic joint infection or non-infectious causes of arthroplasty failure. And as Marisa pointed out, that's really important because the management strategy is really different if there's infection present versus if there's failure for some non-infectious reason. Blood tests such as C-reactive protein can be helpful. And there are other blood tests that are sometimes used such as erythrocyte sedimentation rate or even interleukin-6 or D-dimers. But none of these tests are perfect, and they certainly don't define the microbiology. So when I think about diagnosis, we need to classify the joint as being infected. But then if it is infected, we also need to figure out what that organism is. And to get there, arthrocentesis is really the first step and a very important step in making a diagnosis. Synovial fluid should be assayed for leukocyte count and neutrophil percentage, and then subjected to aerobic and anaerobic cultures. There's some other tests that can be performed on synovial fluid, 
such as alpha defensin, C-reactive protein, just like it can be done on blood, leukocyte esterase and calprotectin, and there are others. But these are typically reserved for challenging cases, and none of these additional diagnostics really tell us anything about what the microbe that's causing infection might be. Marisa mentioned that at surgery, additional specimens can be collected. Tissue should be collected for histopathology. We look for acute inflammation in tissue. Again, that doesn't tell us the organism, but it tells us that there may be infection present. To identify organisms at the time of surgery, multiple tissues are collected, again, as with synovial fluid, for both aerobic and anaerobic culture. And as was already mentioned, sometimes the implant itself is removed as far as the management strategy. And if that happens, then there are techniques that can be used to sample biofilms on the surface of the resected implant. And that can be very useful for microbiologic diagnosis. For example, that can be accomplished using a combination of vortexing and sonication. And then finally, at our institution, Mayo Clinic, we use 16S ribosomal RNA gene PCR in either Sanger or next generation sequencing on synovial fluid and also sometimes on sonicate fluid or periprosthetic tissue when cultures are unrevealing and aren't giving us an answer as to what's causing the infection. Hmm. So, um, Marissa, you know, Robin outlined a lot of kind of nonspecific biomarker testing. Um, culture is obviously key for this. But what are the potential advantages of molecular testing specifically for uh, detection of uh, pathogens for PJI? Mm -hmm. uh, as Robin had just mentioned, uh, although enhanced uh, culture based techniques such as implant sonication, and inoculation of synovial fluid and periprosthetic tissues into blood culture bottles have improved sensitivity, there remains the problem of culture-negative PGI, which uh, can account for up to 40% of PGI cases, as mentioned previously. There is also the issue of prolonged turnaround times, which can lead to a delay in diagnosis and targeted and appropriate treatment. Uh, molecular tests for microbiologic PGI diagnosis have the potential to provide a more rapid diagnosis here. There are also potential advantages of molecular tests improving sensitivity by detecting fastidious organisms or more difficult to grow organisms, as well as pathogens in cases where pre-sampling antimicrobial therapy is given. Also, uh, there is the potential for certain molecular approaches as well to be perhaps more cost effective and less time intensive than more traditional culture based methods. Thank you, Marissa. Robin, let's turn to you. What was the structure of the study that you did? What tests were you, were you looking at, and what was the reference standard that they were compared to? Yeah, so we looked at the investigational use only version of the BioFire joint infection panel. So this study started before this was approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration. And then we also used 16S ribosomal RNA gene-based targeted metagenomic sequencing, which as I mentioned, we've been doing as part of our standard practice uh, here at Mayo Clinic. These synovial fluids also underwent culture as part of routine clinical practice. So what we did was to study 60 synovial fluid samples from knee arthroplasty failure. They had been placed in gamma irradiated vials, and we've been doing this to minimize DNA contamination because as we apply molecular techniques, we want to make sure that we inactivate any uh, stray DNA that might be present. And they have been archived at minus 80 degrees Celsius. So we looked in uh, our freezer stocks uh, and we identified 60 synovial fluid samples that would qualify for this uh, study. All of those samples were collected with informed consent from the patients from whom they were collected and had been gathered at the time they were undergoing arthrocentesis as part of routine clinical practice. We uh, gathered patient demographics and culture results 
through review of the electronic medical record. And we classified our patients using Infectious Diseases Society of America diagnostic criteria for periprosthetic joint infection. So the study included patients who had periprosthetic joint infection and others who didn't, but were having their joints aspirated because they were having uh, problems with the joint. For targeted metagenomic sequencing, as I mentioned, this is something that we do in our routine clinical practice. We did this on the synovial fluid. We treated the synovial fluids with proteinase K and subjected them to bead beading and extracted them on a MagnaPure 96. And then we used primers targeting the B1 through B3 region of the bacterial 16S ribosomal RNA gene to amplify a product using PCR. This was done on a light cycler 482 instrument, and we amplified about 530 base pairs of this 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And then all the samples underwent next generation sequencing with library preparation, normalization, and sequencing done according to the 16S metagenomic sequencing library preparation protocol from Illumina. And the sequencing was done on an Illumina MySeq with a 500 cycle V2 nano kit. Analysis was done using pathogenomics RIPSeq NGS software. The BioFire joint infection panel was uh, uh, performed using the manufacturer's instructions. So curious, Robin, um, you said you investigated the invest or you looked at the investigational use only uh, version. Was there any change between that and the current FDA cleared version, or is it the same same targets? Um, it's the same targets, uh, Ellie. As far as any other changes that uh, may have taken place, I'm I'm not aware of them. But uh, you know, this was this was prior to approval. Yeah, and um, can you just give us a sense of the number of targets on the panel uh, before we dive in? But, but right. please don't list them all. <laughs> yes, please don't. <laughs> you don't want me to list them all. Yeah. All right. So. so- um, so like third, it was 33 targets or no? Did well, I miscount? Do a little math here. I get I 21, know. 22. 21 targets, including. Then, well, that's, those are the organisms. And then there's some antimicrobial resistance markers yeah. as well. Half a dozen or so of those. Yeah, that's right. So we have, um, maybe we should do Well, we, we can move on. I, I can't believe you haven't memorized them, Robin. Well, I have all the words <laughs> here if you'd like me to list them. No, we can move on. But it's... they include a, a number over 10 gram-positive bacteria, over uh, 10 gram-negative bacteria. There are two yeasts, Canada species and Canada albicans. And then uh, five carbapenemase genes, the MECA-C, MREJ element, uh, CTXM, and van a van B. Awesome. Perfect. So... Um, with, with all that in mind, with that nice background, um, Marissa, can you tell us how the BioFire panel performed um, for the pathogens that were included in, its, in, in, in the panel itself? Mm-hmm. So for culture-positive PGI cases with pathogens targeted by the GI panel, GI panel sensitivity was very good at 91%, or 21 out of 23 And the GI panel overall specificity was 100%, or 16 out of 16. Thank you. That's pretty good. And Marissa, how did the targeted metagenomic sequencing perform for those same specimens? It also performed very well. So for culture-positive PGI with pathogens targeted by the GI panel, TMGS sensitivity was 96%, or 23 out of 24 and then TMGS overall specificity was 94% or 15 out of 16. So Robin, um, in reading this study, there were a number of samples that were positive in culture, uh, but they were not included on the BioFire panel and so obviously missed. Can you tell us a little bit about which pathogens those were? Absolutely. Um you know, one of the challenges with panels is you you only detect what's on the panel. And uh, we knew going into this study that the panel wasn't fully representative of all of the common causes of periprosthetic joint infection. And so not surprisingly, the most frequently missed species that had been found in culture in these samples was Staphylococcus epidermidis. That is 
if not the most common, the second most common cause of periprosthetic joint infection, kind of toggles between Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis, depending on the patient population and the study, and it's not included as part of the panel. But uh, periprosthetic joint infection be can be caused by a number of other bacterial species as well. And so there were culture positive periprosthetic joint infection synovial fluids where Streptococcus salivarius group, Enterobacter cloacae complex, Crinobacterium striatum, Leliotia species, and Haemophilus parainfluenzae had been isolated, but were, again, not surprisingly missed by the panel. Thank you, Robin. Um, let's compare that to the targeted metagenomic sequencing. How did that do detecting the pathogens that were missing from the biofire panel? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So the sequencing assay detects the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, which is present in all bacteria. And it detected all of the pathogens that had been cultured from synovial fluid. That's not surprising. But... Um, and those were all, all the ones that were missed by the uh, joint infection panel. But unsurprisingly, it missed Candida albicans, which was detected by the biofire panel, because as I mentioned, it, it is included in that panel. But Candida albicans doesn't have a 16S ribosomal RNA gene, so you wouldn't expect to be able to detect it. And I guess the other category of things that you would miss with the targeted metagenomic sequencing would be those antimicrobial resistance markers, right? Those would not be picked up. Absolutely, yeah. So kind of on the flip side then, there were a number of cases, um, Marissa, that you guys described that met the IDSA definition for a PJI, but for which synovial fluid um, culture was negative. So can you talk a little bit about those cases and how the biofire and the metagenomic sequencing um, assays performed? Mm -hmm. There were five synovial fluid samples, which were IDSA criteria positive for PJI, for which synovial fluid cultures were either negative or not performed. And of these, there were three cases where Staphylococcus aureus was detected by both molecular tests, two of which were negative by synovial fluid culture, but tissue culture positive for S. aureus, which is interesting. In addition, for one of these PGI cases, a sinus tract was present. And for this particular case, Tissue cultures yielded Staph aureus alongside Enterococcus faecalis, E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Bacteroides fragilis group, uh, although none of the organisms aside from Staph aureus were detected in synovial fluid or by either molecular test. Robin, we talked about the sensitivity of the tests for those pathogens that are on the biofire panel. Uh, setting that aside overall, all the samples, what were the sensitivities of the biofire panel and the targeted metagenomic sequencing compared to the culture? Yeah, so if we take just the cases that had positive synovial fluid cultures, I think that's what you're asking about. It is, then, yeah. Uh, the biofire joint infection panel was positive in 21 of 38 of those samples, and that's 55%. And the sequencing-based approach was positive in 38 of 39, or 97%. Uh, there's an extra sample that was tested with sequencing compared to the biofire panel because of an invalid result on the biofire panel. Thank you. And we've talked a lot about the sensitivity. Let's spend just a moment on the specificity. How did the molecular test perform in terms of specificity uh, when you tested the patient samples uh, from patients who did not have prosthetic joint infections? Yeah, that's a really good question. I will say that this was a relatively small study. We, we only looked at 60 synovial fluids, and we picked 16 of them to be from patients who did not have uh, periprosthetic joint infection. So to assess specificity, we're talking about a small number here, just 16 synovial fluids. Uh, that said, there was uh, one false positive result and that was with the sequencing assay, which in one of those non-infected cases detected Streptococcus australis. On the other hand, among those 16 synovial fluids from patients without periprosthetic joint infection, 
there were no false positive results with the biofire assay. Um, you know, I kind of want to take a step back again, and maybe this is not a fair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> Staph epi, right? So a common cause of PGI. I'm wondering if you guys can kind of share with us your thoughts on why it wasn't included in this panel. It's a tough, it's a tough one. We're is asking that you to speculate. But yes, if you're speculation. Yeah, I, I can speculate on that, and, and I'll speculate on one other question that you might ask about periprosthetic joint infection as well. So many of the organisms that cause periprosthetic joint infection are normal microbiota on the skin. So you think about Staphylococcus epidermidis, for example. It's not a primary pathogen in you know, otherwise healthy people. It forms biofilms on surfaces of implants and, and really has declared itself as a major pathogen here in this disease. But, but otherwise, it's part of the normal microbiota and a frequent contaminant and frequently present in, in and around us and in clinical samples. Another example organism that kind of falls in the same category is cutie bacterium acnes. Now that's also not on the panel, and that's not surprising to me. Um, that can cause uh, infections of knee replacements, but is much more common in shoulder arthroplasty infections. Um, it too is not on the panel. So when Marisa and I looked at this panel in the first place, this is not really a panel that's designed specifically for periprosthetic joint infection. It's uh, designed for uh, testing synovial fluid for native joint septic arthritis, adult and pediatric, as well as potentially for maybe some cases of periprosthetic joint infection. So I think uh, that some of the organisms that are on the panel uh, maybe aren't frequent causes of periprosthetic joint infection. You didn't ask me what we didn't detect, but one example is Kingella kingi, right? That's, that's not a pathogen that we think about as being common in periprosthetic joint infection. Alex knows that one very, very well <laughs> yep. as a pediatric uh, mm -hmm. microbiologist because that's where it causes disease, yet that's on the panel. On the other hand, Staphylococcus epidermidis, back to your question, is, is not here. And I can't speak for why the company didn't add it to the panel, but I can say that it can be a difficult organism to target from a molecular standpoint or from a culture-based standpoint because you know we detect it, we recover it. And, and so trying to sort out, is it real or is it not real might be a challenge. I think it can be done, right? I think it could be done by setting the, the threshold for the PCR assay in the right place. Uh, but but certainly, I can see why you might not pick that to include in a panel, just like you might not pick cutie bacterium acnes, which I'm sure would be another struggle to include in a panel like this. Yet, having said that, because, you know, my passion is periprosthetic joint infection, we need panels that include the organisms that are causing the disease we're trying to diagnose. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. I think it's really helpful um, to have your perspective and um, talk about, you know, these panels and how they may not include some of the more common causes and, and why that is. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind. So thank you for that speculation. Um, so, well, you know, we talked about uh, the, the bacterial targets, but one thing we haven't talked about yet, Marissa, is how well this panel performed for detection of the resistance markers that are on there. So can you speak a little bit to that? Yes. Yeah, so this is another area uh, Robin and I were excited to evaluate with the use of the GI panel as the rapid characterization of antimicrobial resistance determinants in PGI should certainly be explored further. And as a reminder, unlike the GI panel, TMGS does not test for antimicrobial resistance. However, in this particular study, none of the targeted resistance genes were detected by the GI panel and were specifically for the 12 Staphylococcus aureus PGI cases that we had in the study. These were associated with oxycillin susceptible uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Marissa, there was a little bit of complexity around the detection of streptococci by the two molecular assays. Can you tease that apart for us? 
Mm -hmm. This is another uh, interesting area that requires further uh, study. So of the synovial fluid samples culture positive for streptococci, both the GI panel and TMGS assay detected streptococcus mitis group and group C streptococcus species. Although it was only the TMGS assay which was able to identify these organisms down to the species and species group level. And if we look into this a bit further, for one case that did not meet criteria for PGI, TMGS detected Streptococcus australis from synovial fluid, and I think Robin had alluded to this previously, this particular case, uh, and this was felt to be a likely false positive result, with the GI panel resulting as negative. And overall, the GI panel detected Streptococcus species in synovial fluids culture positive for uh, strep mitis group and group C streptococcus species, uh, the latter further identified as streptococcus dysgalactiae by TMGS. But the JI panel, interestingly, did not detect streptoco streptococcus salivarius group, uh, whereas all of these were detected by TMGS. So this is another area that uh, needs a bit more teasing out. Nice. Thank you. Um, so, Robin, uh, a question to you. So as these new assays come out, you know, I think it's important to evaluate them as you guys have done. But equally important is to understand where to put this in our current diagnostic processes and diagnostic algorithms. So in, in your opinion, and you guys had a really nice um, flowchart for this, where does this new panel fit um, in our PJI diagnostic processes? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, fortunately, we have more tools today for diagnosis of periprosthetic joint infection than we've ever had. We probably still need some improvement, but we've made a lot of advances. And um, so with all these choices, you know, you have to figure out what are you going to do first and what are you going to do if you don't get an answer with that first test and so on and so forth. A nice feature of this panel is that results are available in about an hour. And, you know, the speed is, is important for some infectious diseases and for getting answers for our patients. However, um, there are some limitations. It's expensive to run this panel. And as we already discussed, it misses some important periprosthetic joint infection pathogens, such as Staphylococcus epidermidis. Furthermore, in unless really there is urgency, you, you have to think about, do I need a rapid diagnostic test for periprosthetic joint infection? I think we could have a debate, a kind of pro-con uh, situation around that. But in many cases, this, this isn't an urgent diagnosis. There, there might be some where that could be the case, but in, in many cases, it's, it's just not. So I still would suggest starting with an arthrocentesis, getting synovial fluid, running that cell count and differential and culture as I outlined previously. And then from that information and clinical assessment of the patient, um, you know, if, if findings aren't pointed, pointing to periprosthetic joint infection, you're kind of finished. But if they are and your cultures are negative, uh, I think that's a point where the BioFire joint infection panel could be performed. Um, that said, you may not get an answer from the panel because there can be organisms that are missing. And if you don't get an answer there, and again, findings are still pointing to periprosthetic joint infection, that's where you might want to consider a targeted metagenomic sequencing type of approach. But these are just my thoughts. We do not have any guidelines yet advising us how this panel should be used because it's so new. It was just approved. It's exciting that it was just approved. And also, our study itself had a lot of limitations. I, I mentioned that it was only 60 samples. It was non-random sample selection. We were pulling them out of our freezers. Some of them were pretty old. Um, we, we actually think that probably didn't matter. But you know, if you look at our samples, some of them were initially archived in the last century. Uh, we have a, a long history of biobanking here and studying this disease. But um, you know that's that's a lot of time, and so how how maybe did that impact our findings? Um, we also use the IDSA diagnostic criteria for periprosthetic joint infection, and those are 
somewhat antiquated at this point in time. Again, we don't really feel like that made a big difference in our study, but that could be a limitation um, of what we did. And I talked about cutie bacterium acnes. We didn't assess any cutie bacterium acnes periprosthetic joint infection. That's more common in shoulder arthroplasty infection. And so that's another point, right? We were looking at knee arthroplasty infections, but we also deal with hip and shoulder and elbow and ankle and other types of arthroplasty infections. And how will this panel do in those? We, we don't really know. I think future studies should look at these other types of joint replacements and how this uh, panel performs and how other diagnostics perform, honestly, uh, for some of those other joint replacement types. And then you probably know I'm a big fan of clinical outcome studies. So maybe we need a study looking at outcomes of patients who get tested with this panel upfront, early on, right? Because that's where if you have a rapid diagnostic, you'd really want to use it versus those uh, managed without it. And, and we look, you know, what difference does that make in terms of what happens to the patient downstream? Um, I will say that one practice that we have found to be really helpful is to collect enough synovial fluid so that this additional testing, such as running the joint infection panel or deep sequencing can be done without having to re-aspirate the patient's joint. So we do ask our clinicians to collect enough. That's actually, it sounds like it would be a problem, but it's not really a problem if you're in there aspirating to get a little extra that we can hold in reserve for add-on testing if we need to uh, get to that point and run tests like the joint infection panel. So what you're saying is there's more to be done. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there's more to be done, but... But I think, um, you know, we have accomplished a lot in terms of understanding the disease, periprosthetic joint infection, and also understanding how to diagnose it. And it's wonderful to have new diagnostics uh, that we can use in our clinical practice. It is wonderful. And for those listeners who thought that an outcome study of a multiplex PCR might be pie in the sky, know this, Robin has done these before. So stay tuned. We may get more on this. <laughs> well, thanks, Marissa and Robin, for joining us to talk about your excellent paper. I urge everyone to go to the show notes and click on the link to the paper. Uh, follow up there. And thank Ellie, so great to see you as always. Oh, thank you, Marissa. Ellie, great to see you as always. I hope you're doing well. Good and to happy see new year. you too, Alex. Happy new year to everyone. Happy New Year to the listeners, and thank you for listening to Editors in Conversation. <laughs>